Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, again, my name is Bert Rodriguez. My full name, uh, Roberto Manuel Tafoya Rodriguez. Uh, because so many Latin folks have way more than just one name or two names. Um, but yes, I actually, uh, initially, I have my uh, father is heritage, just comes from Mexico. My mom uh, is Spanish. And uh, growing up, I primarily identified uh, with my Mexican heritage and used to sing mariachi music all the time uh, with my family, um, but didn't necessarily know a ton about um, the music in Spain. So I was so excited when this project came along um, because it offered me an opportunity to sort of connect to my mom's side of, uh, of my heritage in a way uh, that is really important to me, which is through music. Now, my mom's last name is, or her maiden name is Tafoya, and can be directly tr traced. I think um, there's a couple famous tef uh, Tafoyas out there. There's a uh, uh, Michelle Tafoya from ESPN. She was a very famous uh, sports uh, reporter for a very long time, sports anchor. Um, but anybody with the last name of Tafoya, however it's spelled, Tafoya, Tafaya with a Y, double L, everything traces back to the town of Tafaya in Spain, which is just, uh, just south of Pamplona. And I'm particularly proud of that because uh, the town was known uh, for harboring uh, and safekeeping uh, the Moors during the Spanish Inquisition. So um, they really, the, the folks of that town really felt strongly uh, about doing something more for their fellow human being. Uh, so that already gave me something to really connect me and to be passionate about. And then I started learning about, um, <laughs> about Zarzuela. So I was like, well, what is this, what is this actually about? So I, before we get into this, uh, how many of you out there have ever heard something from an opera? Great, I love that. And how many of you have ever heard something from a, a musical, from musical theater? Right, so they're very similar. Uh, so what, can someone tell me what, what's something that you is like characteristic, super like characteristic to an opera? Something that like is specific to that, to that genre? Anything at all? Vibrato. Vibrato, <laughs> absolutely, that's great. Um, anything else? Arias. Like Arias, absolutely, yes. Something else? Orchestra. Orchestra, drama, yes, this is great. All of these things. So opera uh, traditionally takes us through the story, uh, traditionally utilizes singers uh, as the actors, uh, to, and then the, it's usually sung through. So we've got recitative, which is like spoken to, to, uh, to pitch, and then we have the arias, which is like the full songs, which are sort of usually more recognizable, more famous. Um, can someone name some famous popular operas out there? Yes, 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 La madam. Wim. Yes, La Boheme, the like Puccini, the, ma the yeah, Magic Flute. Yeah, 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 we can go on and on and on. Now, how about musical theater? How many of you, what, what do you think is characteristic of musical theater? Less vibrato. Less vibrato. <laughs> yes, sometimes we utilize straight tone a lot more in that genre. What else? Singing the story. Singing the story. That's what a great, that actually is a perfect bridge to one of the main differences uh, between musical theater uh, and opera is in musical theater we have spoken scenes uh, that go in between a lot of the music. Um, it utilizes dance in a different way than in opera. Often uh, in an opera we have a separate dance chorus that comes in to provide that part, that part of the show. Uh, often in musicals, the same performers who are doing the dancing are the, are the people who are doing the singing, are the people who are doing the acting. So what it does in musical theater is it combines all of those elements in equal importance, right? Whereas in opera, that's music forward. In musical theater, we, it puts everything on the same level while trying to incorporate as many different art forms into that as possible, because we also have the costumes and the scenery. So there's a lot in common. There's a lot that's overlapping, but they're very distinct styles. Now, musical theater um, has been designated a, a uniquely American art form that um, started to gain popularity around the turn of the century. Now, here's where I'd like to talk a little bit about Zarzuela and sort of make the connection. Why is he asking us all these things about these other art forms? Right, so Zarzuela, as we see on the screen, uh, is, is a Spanish lyric dramatic genre that alternates between sung and spoken scenes, much like musical theater, incorporating operatic, and popular songs as well as dance. So it has elements of musical theater. Now what I think is really interesting about Zarzuela is that uh, the earliest forms of it actually uh, were around in the year 1630. Uh, 
which is way, 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 way before musical theater ever, ever made its first appearance. Even if you take into consideration uh, the works of Gilbert and Sullivan uh, and all of those things, uh, musical theater really didn't start to like gain its popularity until like 1910, like around that era. So Zarzuela was already doing things that we have come to know and, and normalize in musical theater long, long before that. So Zarzuela can actually be divided into two time periods. So you've got Baroque Zarzuela, which is from 1630 to 1750. And then there was about literally an, an entire hundred year gap where no new Zarzuelas were written. And then we have the resurgence of the Romantic era. So we've got Zarzuela Romantica, which is from 1850 to 1950. And then it stops, like literally stops. No new Zarzuelas uh, have been, or, or major Zarzuelas have been written since 1950. They were very epic. They were grand in, in scope uh, and spectacle. And so they were very, very, very expensive to put on. Think of like the most opulent musical theater or op opulent operatic piece you can think of, and then multiply that at 10, and that was what a Zarzuela was. So it was a huge, huge deal. We can further break these down into two categories, um, genero grande and genero chico, which literally means, so the genero, genero grande is free act. So we've got a full show. These were three hour, four hour long events sometimes. And then, which eventually gained popularity, the Genero Chico, which is just a little one act. You got everything come to the, they often utilize more popular music uh, of the time as well. Uh, and eventually grew to become sort of the standard because it was more accessible. It was easier to produce and it was easier to buy a ticket to. So more people could access it. Uh, so that's sort of the, the intro to Zarzuela. So the pieces that we're gonna be presenting for you tonight uh, all come from the Romantic period. And I'm actually going to take a little backward step in time. So we're going to start with uh, one that was written in the 1920s and sort of work our way backwards to the very beginning of the Romantic period. Uh, can everybody hear me all right, by the way? That's wonderful. I love that story. Cool. All right. So our first piece uh, is uh, from, uh, would you like to, oh yeah, well, I'll introduce our performers. They're waiting, they're waiting anxiously in the wings. Uh, so we'll bring them on out. So performing for you this evening, we have Stephanie Diaz and Jose Manuel Lopez. Uh, so our first piece is from the Zarzuela, Doña Francisquita. Now this one was perf first performed in 1923, uh, composed by Amadeo Vives and libretto by Federico Romero and Guillermo Fernandez Shaw. This piece uh, is the Coro de Romantico. So this is literally uh, a sort of, uh, think of it as a sort of flirtatious, first date sort of back and forth uh, dialogue that's going on, a sort of, I like you, but I'm not gonna say it. But I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna uh, tell you a little bit and then I'm gonna turn away. Uh, so it's a little, got a little bit of that. It's a very, very beautiful melody. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to present the Coro de Romanticos from Doña Francisquita.
con febril temblor noche misteriosa madre del amor vamos ya caballero palante a correr la amorosa aventura me venció tu gala en la hermosura Caballero, palante, 
even though uh, most of Joyla tends to be very comic uh, and lighthearted, we do have our bits of drama. So thank you for bringing the drama, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we're going to go even further back uh, to one that I particularly enjoy called El Barberio de la Vapies, uh, the Cancion de Paloma. So this premiered on December 18th, 1874, so very close to the beginning of the, the, the earliest uh, romantic zarzuelas. Uh, and it was written with music by Francisco Ansejo Barbieri and libretto by Luis Mariano de Larra. Now a lot of people consider this to be the greatest zarzuela of the 19th century. Uh, and this is the one that I wanted to bring attention to because it was unusual in that it actually did deal uh, with political commentary uh, to the negative. There was a very unpopular uh, prime minister at the time, so they modeled the character of the prime minister in the Zarzuela after that very actual historical figure. Uh, and the plot of, uh, of this, because why not, uh, they all deal with uh, lovers who are frustrated, who want to be with other people. But this one in particular, the, the spoken of lovers, are also conspiring to overthrow the prime minister. So just lighthearted fare, you know, no big deal. Um, I think that's hilarious because where else would you find that? If you tried to pitch that to somebody now for a musical or a play or an opera, they'd be like, what? No, go somewhere else. <laughs> um, so this story follows the exploits of Lamparilla, uh, the barber dentist, which was very common at the time to have those two things be together. Uh, who resolves to help both his frustrated lover friends and potential conspirators to overthrow the unpopular prime minister. Um, and this, uh, this piece in particular is just so nice because it, it opens the show, uh, the Canción de Paloma, and is literally just a love letter to the city. And it's exactly what I was talking about, about being proud of, of presenting uh, everything that they love about the city, the way the architecture, the way it looks, the people, um, it's just, it's full of pride, uh, and you, I really think that the song conveys that. Uh, if you listen, the, the chords that are used, it's all, it's all very, um, they're all major chords, they're all very happy, they're easily accessible major chords, um, in most of the songs in G major, uh, and it's only when we start to get a little, like, cheeky that the, you'll notice there's a shift uh, in the, the meter, so it goes from this like very one, two, three, one, two, three, into a two, four feel. So it, it has a, a, a very distinct, different feel to it uh, as they're sort of being cheeky with each other. Um, yes. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you the Canción de Paloma from El Barberio de la Vapies, performed by Stephanie Diaz and José Manuel López, with slight little uh, assistance from Bert Rodriguez at the piano. <laughs> Venimos 
tonight. Anybody have anything? Yes. I happened more in the Baroque um, the Baroque era. In the Baroque era, the characters and the stories tended to be uh, about either religious figures. Uh, so, of course, uh, in Spain, that would have, of course, been about Christianity, Christianity Catholicism. Um, or uh, the idea of, like, uh, more, like, gods and goddesses of, of, like, going all the way back um, and sort of taking from the stories uh, of the great playwrights um, uh, from that time, like uh, Euripides, um, like all, all of the old Greek authors. Um, so in that time period, you would get a lot of repetition uh, in what the stories were about and what the Zarzuelas were written about. But as we move forward, uh, they tended to be uh, about specifically Spanish things. And that's what I think is, is really interesting about it which is, again, why I find it fascinating as it sort of spread and moved into other countries like the Philippines and, and Cuba. When you look at their stories, the musical styles are similar because it harkens back to the sort of Spanish folkloric sound and flamenco and all of those sort of elements. Um, but the story, the story plots are very specific to the countries themselves. Uh, so I, th I think that's really fascinating. But that's a great, great question. And often uh, in the in the Romantic period, particularly some of them, the the second one, the La Verbena, uh, that one, for example, uh, that composer was very well known uh, for their patter songs. Uh, and another uh, sort of uh, uh, very distinguished composer, composing duo, Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, of course, became uh, the English composers became very well known for their for their patter songs, and of course were precursors to the musical theater genre as well, uh, and often uh, their works are performed sort of both ways. You might find a Gilbert and Sullivan piece in an opera season, and you might find a Gilbert and Sullivan piece in a musical theater season. Um, so they all were borrowing from each other uh, a little bit, like here and there, but it's particularly more as we got further on in years. Yes? Were there unique instruments in the orchestration? Absolutely. Another great question. So, um, so for this, I'm actually going to sort of harken back to, to my mariachi days. Uh, so have you ever been to, to Epcot and seen mariachi cobre there? They're fantastic, right? So those instruments that you, that you see featured in sort of a mariachi band, uh, like 
The reason that we have that is it comes from the sort of orchestral arrangements from these uh, Spanish opera, operettas, as well as combinations. Uh, and the mariachis, of course, took that so that they could wander and sing and play in the square in a way that was different from going to an actual theater. So the mariachi sort of brought it to, um, to the people where they were without having to pay for a ticket necessarily. But those same instruments are very prominently, strongly featured in a lot of the Zarzuela music. What are those instruments, you might ask, Bert? Uh, so those are things, so there's a lot of strings. So much of this is, is, is stringed instruments. And that's why you hear a lot. Zarzuela is full of very, very complex things that happen all the time, which are very are so much easier to be played on an instrument where all you have to do is a to make those notes come out. Often when you have a piano reduction and then you're trying to play it, it's like, why? Who did this? Who did this to me? Um, but yes, so there's lots of stringed instruments, um, uh, lots of horns uh, for, for excitement, dramatic. And then, of course, like the, the percussion is everywhere. Percussion, the sort of the flamenco castanets uh, are prevalent all throughout. And that goes all the way back even in, in the Baroque period, which I think is really interesting, again, that sort of hundred year gap where nothing new in this like art form was written. I, I find it fascinating that we stuck to those same instruments and we brought them with us along into an entire new century. I think that's really fascinating. Yes? Would you, would you be able to give us an idea of why there was a hundred year gap like that? Was there something going on in the world? Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. They, uh, they, Spain fell on incredibly uh, rough economic times, uh, and there just wasn't an appetite for anybody to even be able to afford it. Uh, nobody could even uh, afford to go do anything theatrical because the country was in, in such dire economic straits. Uh, and that's specifically why there was nothing uh, in, in the Zarzuela form written at that time. Many composers who had previously been uh, com uh, composing for the Zarzuela art form, uh, shifted into just making songs. So rather than having songs uh, as a part of a show, they shifted into just producing work. The same way that song songwriters will write for a specific artist now, they might do the same thing for a famous performer of the time and write a song for them uh, to still try to make their living. But in general, um, it just wasn't happening in the time because nobody could afford it. Yes? Uh, almost all of the Zarzuelas began uh, begin in Madrid. Um, that was where. So the even the name of Zarzuela comes from um, the Teatro de Zarzuela, which is where the first it's where the Palace of Zarzuela, where uh, the first uh, Zarzuela was said to have been performed. And even that comes from the name uh, the trees surrounding the palace, uh, where were brambles uh, and zarza uh, translates to brambles. Uh, in English, and that's sort of where that comes from. Um, but if sort of how in the United States, how like if you want your musical to be known everywhere, it has to start in New York, and then it sort of makes its way out. That was what it was like for Zarzuela. If you wanted your Zarzuela to have to be popular and to be well known, you tailored it, you made it, you premiered it in Madrid, and then it and then it gradually went out to the rest of the country. But there were but there were uh, theater specific. Um, much the same way uh, we had like vaudeville houses all, all across the U.S. before we sort of now shift to we've got these great performing arts centers. Um, but it was sort of the same way. Uh, a lot of times a town would spring up around a theater. We'd have, uh, because the arts, again, we, it's so often that we minimize the importance uh, of arts in the community. Um, but entire towns were created just because of the theater, just because people wanted, didn't want to have to go, go all the way to Madrid to see this. And so somebody would say, well, let's build a theater. And then the, the theater ended up building a town. Yes? So I have two questions now. Oh, one, so where is our, our say it again? Zar, I Zarzuela. 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 Um, in a sense, you know, like you mentioned about Boraville, but then, and I don't know when this started in America, but, you know, we're off, not really off Broadway, but Broadway shows started, you know, big production started moving around, you know, uh, our cities. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, I mean, I guess now they do just go to the, the performing arts centers. Mm -hmm. But but it seems 
to me, before those those were around, we had um, they would show up in smaller venues. Yeah. They would you know kind of stuff it in a smaller venue. I guess. Sure. I didn't get to go to many of them, but um, but so did they have that similar kind of thing with? Or was it too big a production? Because you mentioned there was three act productions. Right. No, act. it's like you're writing my presentation for me. This is so great. I didn't take notes because I want to... No, I love that. Thank so. you. So, I would be you if I were at this presentation fully with my phone <laughs> writing notes. Um, yes, exactly. So the whole the whole reason that um, Gerardo Chico uh, came about, like I said, was because these huge presentations were very difficult. You couldn't travel them. They couldn't go anywhere else. Or, I mean, they could, but it was very specific because they were so large and opulent. So Gerardo Chico, uh, those were more uh, prone, isn't the word I want to use, but it was far more likely to see a traveling uh, group of performers with a Gerardo Chico who could just roll up, sort of like you see in the old movies and the, like, the big wagons, and then like, they just create their stage there. That actually uh, was very common for uh, Gerardo Chicos. And as we sort of shifted into the 1900s and we start to get... To the, to the end of sort of the romantic period of, of Zarzuela, then they became actual like traveling companies that would take, um, that would specifically uh, originate at the Theater de Zarzuela in Madrid and would take the shows out. On the road. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Uh, as opposed to just having many productions. But that second one, like I said, the one that had three premieres in the same night, uh, another, I think, interesting fact is that all three of them were different. So it was the same story, and it had mostly the same music, but each of them would have like a different like popular song inserted in there in a different place. Or they would have a completely different dance in the middle of it based on who the performing group was and who they had hired to do that. Um, and it was all still considered the same show, because you still had the same story arc, same characters, and most of the same information in between. But they uh, had they enjoyed rather the the flexibility of sort of being able to like pick and choose what best worked for them. That's kind of cool because then, then you could go to all three shows and still enjoy the hell out of it and see something entirely <laughs> different. Yeah, and be like, oh, that was so neat how they did that. So my other question was, you mentioned that there was um, the and and she and she the first um, was adapted for cinema in 20, 1921, 1935, and nineteen sixty three. And then you did say something about YouTube, and what I was kind of curious about was um, not because YouTube's you know not that old, but uh, is it, would any of those since they were adapted for cinema, like um, I will go and watch I watch something called Stella Mars or something like that. It took me forever to find it, but it was supposed to be like a phenomenal. Um, in that case. Yes. No, no speaking, whatever. It was a silent movie. Uh huh. And and I just was, you know, I finally found it, and uh, I think I had to read it actually. But um, so does does are any of these available in the sense of being able to find them somewhere on some archive site? Absolutely. So um, what I think is really great is that seeing as how there no major news Arzuela works were created after 1950, but they've sort of recently come into. Um, I won't say prominence, but they, uh, it, it's been noted that this is a thing that could easily go away, uh, in that no one is creating it anew. So organizations have taken to specifically putting on these, these shows um, to, and then preserving them, and then recording them, releasing, releasing um, uh, you know, albums so that you can find them. So that's the long way of saying yes. Uh, everything, everything that was that was performed uh, tonight, uh, you could go on YouTube and actually find a full presentation of. Um, often by the BBC, uh, the National Theatre um, uh, of Mexico uh, has done a couple as well. Um, I know that in our in our research for finding these, we we referenced the heck out of YouTube to be able to to figure out what was going on and the best way to present them. So yes, you could find all of these on, on YouTube if you wanted. Great, great, thanks. Yes? Uh, you have an encyclopedic knowledge of something that most of us know nothing about. <laughs> Where did you uh, gain all of this knowledge with your, with your research? Good old interwebs. <laughs> yeah, so I would, uh, honestly, I just, I started with the, the information that was available just on, on Wikipedia, and then from there I went to see where, what they sourced. 
Uh, and then I, I looked at I looked up those books and articles online and sort of read about that. Um, I asked my parents, I asked my mom uh, if she knew anything. Her family is super musical. Uh, she is not, notably, musical at all. But, uh, but I asked her if she'd ever heard any of this, and she said that her mom actually uh, used to have a, a, a record of, um, of the Doña Francisquita, the first one um, that we performed. She had an a, a actual uh, vinyl record of that, which I think is really cool. So. It is? Do you think there's much interest in the um, current highly popular genre, like Jennifer Lopez putting together, collaborating on bringing back something like Salsuela? I think anything like that is possible, and I think that's, you know, the really amazing thing about art is that it adapts to its time period. So I feel like all it would take is for like you said, a, a celebrity or a group of celebrities or a group of well-funded arts enthusiasts uh, to bring this back. And I, I, again, the, the nature of it, the idea that it, I, particularly the idea of taking sort of like popular music of the time and, and sort of combining that with new original things is really in keeping with, with a lot of, of popular theater presentations of today. So I don't think it's out of the question it's just a matter of showing it to them. So if you'd all like me to give you Jennifer Lopez's address, um, I can't do that. But um, you're welcome to try to find that on uh, YouTube as well. <laughs> well, let's give Bert a hand. Thank you.